journalism is under attack like never before. Oh, no, husband's being cheered, gas fired. You have to have the facts. Beautiful, but tragic. Because people are doubting everything. You're the only way of telling their story. How would you describe this outbreak? Something like an apocalypse. You're going to be really tired. You're going to be really scared. It's too dangerous, you know. Anyone who says they're not scared is lying. Anything can happen. Did you get hurt? I sometimes wonder, how have we managed to get out of this? People being killed. We do genuinely believe in what we do. He's clearly marked as press. To show the truth. Wow, this is absolutely unbelievable. To uncover an injustice. This is the result of ethnic cleansing. I don't think any journalist wants anything more than that. I'm Alex Crawford. I'm Stuart Ramsey. And this is Hotspots. Coming up on Hotspots, we gain rare access to North Yemen and witness a country torn apart by war, nine of them dead, hunger, and now coronavirus. There was a really high number of health workers who had died. And I'm in Chihuahua State in Mexico, where our people smuggling story takes an unexpected turn. These are women, and they deal with children. We did not see them cross. It just it all felt wrong. They targeted this house that used to contain three families. All of them women and children. 80% of the population of Yemen cannot survive without help. Yemen is basically divided into two. It's got the Houthi rebels in charge in the north. They are backed by Iran. And then in the south, you've got the internationally recognized government supported by a coalition of countries spearheaded by Saudi Arabia and backed by Britain, America and the United Arab Emirates. All of these outside countries are funding this very long, protracted, and bloody war. Not only is it the world's worst humanitarian disaster, but it was also now being hit by a global pandemic. This was one country which was already on its knees. And what does it mean to millions and millions of people who are caught in this crisis? <laughs> We spent probably two years trying to get visas and access to get back into Yemen, which is a very complicated procedure. Ahmed Baida is basically Mr. Yemen. Uh, yesterday, the front line was very hot and it's very dangerous for um, snipers. Uh. So they, they said we have to talk to the, the, the biggest high commander. And he's done almost the impossible, which is be a Yemeni and straddle both sides of the conflict. Ahmed Beda said to us, welcome to Yemen. This is the land before coronavirus. It's like it had never happened. Have you had many people coming asking for medicines for coronavirus? No. Do you think many people have got ill and died from it here in Yemen? No, she might. Why do you think there's no corona in Yemen? Allah. There was a really high number of health workers who had died, which suggested that the coronavirus deaths as a whole were way off the scale. Against corona. How do you describe cut? It's an upper. That's what the kids would call it. This is good. Anti-coronavirus. And the secret behind it is you keep on sort of slowly adding these cut leaves into the side of your mouth and you end up growing this massive bulge. That guy literally can't speak. He's got so much cat in his mouth. <laughs> it just looks bizarre. Just a big lump here. And just having a normal conversation, just this big lump. Just... <laughs> 
our minder is laughing at me because I keep on putting on the hand sanitizer. He says, you keep putting it on all the time, all the time. Another one who doesn't believe in coronavirus. We went to the main coronavirus hospital in Sana. What the doctors were saying there was very different to what the Houthi authorities were telling their people, which was that coronavirus wasn't really an issue or a problem. Can you hear me all right? There was a really high number of health workers who had died. That was very worrying because the medical infrastructure is so fragile anyway. We are in an emergency situation already. It's tough. We hope we hope to uh, another organization to help us. We hope to send a message for the war, to stop the war, stop the conflict, and uh, help the Yemeni to negotiation and peace. Coronavirus is definitely rampant and much worse than what the authorities are saying, but it's not nearly as bad as all the other problems that Yemenis are having to cope with. I have no idea how many hours we actually spent traversing that country. Because it went on hour after hour after hour. Mohammed Ali al Houthi is one of the most senior figures in the Houthi movement. It's very rare to be given access outside of his office. Somehow these four by four vehicles would be gingerly going up and down all the huge boulders and round hairpin bends. I don't even know how you'd do it on foot. This is what the uh, North Yemenis have to put up with. Really poor infrastructure anyway, and what little they have has been bombed. So here you have Muhammad Ali al Houthi, one of the most influential people in the Houthi controlled part of the country. <laughs> Essentially, trying to broker a peace deal between two warring factions. But warring factions within his territory, which gives you an idea of just how complicated and just how fractured Yemen is. What was most notable was one, almost everyone had a gun or a weapon. And two, how united they were in their condemnation and hatred of the West and America. <laughs> Whatever quarrels they had amongst each other, the big enemy and the enemies were those that were part of the, the coalition that was making the North Yemenis suffer so much. Excuse me, sir. Do you think these people are united against the coalition? We 
we'd heard of this attack, an airstrike in a very remote mountainous area near the Saudi border. And we set out to investigate it. Yeah, the journey to the Lasha area was incredibly difficult. Finally here. God knows how these people live up here. There's no electricity, no running water, and they've been bombed. No outsider had been there before we got there. Tell me what happened that day. كلنا إيش إيش كلها حدث يوم الأحد تاريخ إن سنة 12 of July 2020 they targeted this house that used to contain three families nine of them dead this house used to be four rooms and a living room and all of it is destroyed all of them women and children. I saw body fragments in my roof. And most of them are kids and women. There were the remnants of people's lives there. This is the shrapnels that we found from the missile. All around here, as far as you can see, there is just mountains, farms, small communities. Very difficult to see what could be conceived of as a legitimate military target here. Ahmed, do you get depressed seeing things like that over and over again? Yeah. It was very, very difficult. But the most important thing is we send the story to people all around the world. They have to know how people are suffering. It's one of the most difficult trips that I have done. But I really think it's worth it. Even all of the barriers and how it's very hard. And you can see now how it's very difficult. Thank you, Samah. Well done, Samah. My drivers are the best always. Well <laughs> they pulled out three survivors. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. We first went to um, the young woman's house. She was the matriarch of the house, just a young woman. She had two children who died in that bombing. He was a young boy, this 14-year-old or something like that. 
I was in a coma for five days. The physical scars had more or less healed, but he was still obviously so emotionally traumatized. I was very shocked when they told me that most of my family have been killed. We got our stories out uh, whilst we were in Yemen, and we got, Alex, in fact, got a, an email from a senior UN lawyer who is investigating accusations of, of war crime, alleged war crimes. There was a massacre that day, and someone should be held accountable for that. It's very hard to exaggerate just how bad the humanitarian crisis is in Yemen. Most explicitly uh, is showing you, you know, the story of one clinic in one province of northern Yemen. That was the introduction, you know, this is the real, this is the real side of it now, you know. These are mothers who are cradling their children as they gasp for breath. Every single child was in a terrible state. Most of them were there because they didn't have enough to eat. You know, here in 2020, there are children dying. Lots of them dying because they don't have enough to eat. For me, I, it, the pictures are bad enough, but it was just the, the sound of crying children, and it was constant. Oh, poor thing. Goodness me, it doesn't look well at all. It was a desperate, desperate sight. There didn't seem to be enough medics ah, to cope with these continual mounting, never-ending challenges of just trying to fight to save baby, child, toddler. And then we noticed they brought in an oxygen tank next to one of the beds, there was this tiny, tiny little scrap of a thing with tiny little hands and fingers. And they had this device that was monitoring the heartbeat and this baby was really struggling. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, she she died in that little bed, and and I, I just uh, you know, let's see, I'm pulling up a bit now, but uh, it just started crying, and and, and I, I you know I, got, I had to stop because you know I was absolutely crying my eyes out, literally crying my eyes out. I just couldn't see my, my hand, let alone the lens, you know. It, I just had to stop what I was doing. When the mothers just sort of melted away and went back to their, their own children. It's a preventable death. It's not like an inevitable death. It's uh, something that we can prevent by only giving birth. Poor little things are just, you know, how simple is that? If they just had some food. These are the kinds of stories that you find across the country. It's not in one specific place, it's not on one specific side, it's children who are starving to death. It's children who are being maimed, who are being shot, who are being killed, in some cases being recruited as soldiers to fight. It was just frustration, I think, was the, the, the overwhelming takeaway that I had. It was just an absolute frustration that this has been going on for years. It seems like there's no end in sight, frankly. It doesn't matter how much all these other countries try and absolve themselves of responsibility. They are all responsible for perpetuating this war. Because right now, Yemen's just in the middle of a war that's not even in their control. Yemenis were so excited uh, to see Westerners back in the country. Thank you. You know, I think the tourists back or the Westerners back in the country. I want to tell you that you are the best people. And there wasn't a single restaurant that we went to that weren't so generous and, and kind and helpful and accommodating when we'd come in. Hi, girls. <laughs> I think Yemen is very much the forgotten war in many ways. Because it's so hard for independent journalists to get in, it's not given much recognition. It's a stunning country which really doesn't deserve to, to live under the sh this shadow of, of death and war all the time. It's really difficult to get in. And once you're in, you have to really make every second, every minute, every hour count. The guy in charge was basically like out of a Tarantino movie. He was somebody you didn't want to get on the wrong side of. I thought that something doesn't feel quite right here. We had another story, and it's just literally around the corner. It's one of the things I love about this job. It's a constant adventure. Here was a story about one of our most precious natural resources, water. You thought we were doing one story. We ended up doing a completely different one. Mexico is a fantastic place to work. It's quite fun, the people are really nice. And then you have these undertones of really, real nasty stuff as well. So it's perfect, it's great stories. 
and it's next door to the United States with this what, nearly 2,000 mile long border. Its position as the country of transit for huge amounts of drugs to the United States is very interesting and challenging as a journalist. Mexico's a really cool country. Cities are cool, the scenery's cool and the people are cool. Um, and there's just loads of really fascinating stories. It's edgy as well. You can find yourself in a dangerous situation pretty easily. It's kind of the gift that keeps on giving as far as storytelling goes. So this is where somebody's been killed, right? It's a place that seems to be a constant source of stories for us. We've been with gangs making crystal meth. We have joined the police and we've joined drug cartels in Acapulco. We've been to opium fields that you could never get to unless you knew they were there. And we've been with people being trafficked across the border to the United States. You're often dealing with inherently dodgy people. You have to be thinking constantly about your own security. You have to be thinking about if they're telling you the truth. Yeah, well, here we are in uh, Chihuahua. I'm not absolutely certain what we're up to really at the moment. So we're once again trying to be with crime gangs, and you never know if they're going to be on time or not. We had heard about the smuggling ring in Juarez that actually specializes in children, unaccompanied minors. During COVID-19, the Trump administration deported many children back to Mexico, and many were trying to get back to their parents, to their families inside the US. So there was this whole market, for lack of a better word, in smuggling children. Juarez is one of the most infamous border towns in Mexico. It's completely controlled by the cartels. It has incredible levels of movement of migrant people. It has a drug trade. It has so much danger that a few years ago, you would regularly see bodies hanging from motorway bridges. So a really, really dangerous place, always. Staying alert is the name of the game when you're working in place like Juarez. The police are going around in pickup trucks, but with heavy machine guns, very heavily armed themselves. So you're aware that trouble could come your way very easily. Good reason it's known as one of the nastiest places on Earth. Yeah. You can't just idly wander around and say, oh, that's a nice picture, let me take a picture of that. You actually got to think, what are you doing? How long am I going to be here for? And then let's get it done, get in the car and keep moving. Ulysses has worked with us for a very long time now. He's our main guy, he gets things done, he understands what we need. He's the guy who will reach out to various contacts to make stories happen. Ulysses introduced us to a journalist friend of his who had good contacts with a cartel-controlled gang who smuggled drugs, but also people. Well, we're off to meet um house with uh, coyotes. Now, coyotes are the people who um, take uh, would-be migrants to the United States across the border. Uh, we've met loads of them over the years. Um, what's uh, intriguing about this is that these are women and they, they deal with children. So we went to film at the location where they keep the children and families in the days before they're waiting to cross. And there, there were two children, a brother and a sister, and there was a woman with her daughter, and they all wanted to go to America. We met a woman who was the coyote, who was going to be their guide. Some people would say that you shouldn't be doing this because it's up to the authorities, the children should go legally and it shouldn't happen. What do you say to those people? She is a gang member, and she is being paid to do it, but she seemed to have a genuine belief that she was doing the right thing for these children. They have no real moral issue about what they're doing with children because actually they're doing humanitarian work because they're reuniting them with their parents. OK. And then we met the ringleader who runs this network. 
Ok. He pulled out, you know, a kilo of cocaine. Ah, 750 gramos. Friendly to us, but he was somebody you didn't want to get on the wrong side of. The process of getting over, how is it done? Are women less stopped? Una mujer puede andar con, con niños. Un hombre no. Yeah. Imagínate con niñas. The guy in charge was basically like out of a Tarantino movie. I mean, you couldn't have made it up. He was an interesting character. I had no reason to doubt that he is indeed a gangster in charge of the coyotes that move the kids and certainly has some part to play in the movement of people and drugs for the cartels. People like him are not unusual in a place like Mexico and certainly not in Juarez. Este... Mira. I don't know what it was, but from the moment that I stepped in that flat, I thought that something doesn't feel quite right here because everything is going to plan and it never goes to plan. This was just going too smoothly. Having done so much work with gangsters, I mean, nothing ever happens on time. You usually spend days waiting and then it's on, then it's off, on, off, on. This one just went according to plan. At that point, I didn't say, right, guys, we need to leave. This is nonsense. I thought, okay, there's no harm in keeping filming, giving the story the benefit of the doubt and seeing how it all plays out. We were then invited to join them as they moved up towards the border with the United States. There was this lady and her young daughter that were going to be smuggled across. But why would you be doing the crossing in the middle of the day? It just doesn't really make sense. If they don't want to be seen, surely you'd go at night. For me, the absolute main box tick, if I can put it that way, to verify the story was going to be actually seeing these migrants cross the border, like actually seeing it with our own eyes. They're crossing over the Rio Grande, which is once upon a time a very major river. It's now pretty much a sort of uh, dry um, canal to all intents and purposes. And on the other side, they're going to be uh, picked up um, by people who are waiting for them. Initially, we thought that I might break away from the rest of the team and go up to the border to witness the crossing. But that suddenly got the kibosh. And then it was that we couldn't drive to a place where we could actually oversee the border. We had to stay back. And it became apparent that they didn't want us to see the crossing. And again, alarm bells ringing. We did not see them cross into the United States. It just all felt wrong at that point. We didn't see them crossing. That left me feeling very uncomfortable because although there were elements of the story that I believe were absolutely true and that the characters as individuals were true, I just wondered whether the scenario that we had just filmed was actually a real scenario. And as it turned out, actually, all of us individually, including our fixers, were kind of struggling a bit with it and thinking something's not quite right here. And that's when, as a team, we actually sat down and had a conversation about it. You do not want to ring your boss and say, I'm really sorry, but we've come all this way to do a story that didn't stand up. But if it's not on, we're not running the story. That, that's something you have to do. We go to great pains to make sure the stories we tell are accurate, even more so now in an environment where the fake news label is thrown around so readily. You cannot risk having any mistakes whatsoever, even if they're genuine mistakes, because people who want to discredit you will pick up on those and use that to call the whole thing fake news. We really didn't know whether the end of our story was legit or not. So we decided to give them an opportunity, show us pictures from inside the United States, and we can go with the story. No pictures, no story that never materialized. And so we had to make the decision to bin the story. Ulysses rang the coyote, yeah, said, bad. what happened there? And she said, listen, it was all real. It's just, he overdid it in the end. The elements were all real. It's just, it didn't happen when we were there. 
you have to be correct every single time. There cannot be any holes in the stories you're doing. I don't feel we failed. And in fact, it's probably a success because failure would have been reporting something that wasn't true. When we made the decision not to file that story, I felt a wave of relief. I actually slept well that night, and I know for sure that if we'd pursued and carried on with that story, I wouldn't have slept at all that night. You're disappointed. You spent a lot of time working on this story, but you have to accept it didn't work out and you move on. And of course, the amazing thing about our job Perhaps the amazing thing about Mexico is that it's actually another story, and it's just literally around the corner. And we had one more that we'd been looking at for a while, which is about a dispute between local farmers and the Mexican government over water. Chihuahua is a huge state and a very dry one. It would be a desert but it has huge rivers that flow through it, and those rivers then go into reservoirs, and from the reservoirs, they can basically feed the earth and grow, and it, as a result, it's sort of agricultural center for Mexico, and it's full of farmers, producing a whole range of vegetables and livestock. It is a massive production area, and that's all to do with irrigation. One of my concerns going to do this story was that it was almost too local for international viewers to grasp it. But what really struck me was that here was a story about the future of one of our most precious natural resources, water. Mexico and the United States have a 70-year-old agreement for sharing water. On one side of the country, Mexico sends it to the United States, and on the other side of the country, the United States sends it to Mexico. Mexico messed up its water supply agreement to the United States and decided they needed water from reservoirs. Reservoirs belong to the farmers who need the water to grow the crops, which, ironically, are then sold to the United States, 100% of them. That was the basis of this story. International agreement between two big countries and a small group of farmers stuck in the middle saying, you're not having our water. The farmers, they had taken over the dam from the authorities and were not going to budge. It was their water as far as they were concerned and it was going to stay that way. What we found was a real eye-opener because we met educated, successful, non-violent, non-aggressive, big farmers prepared to actually fight, physically fight, the National Guard to save their water. It was remarkable. Meeting the farmers was a welcome contrast to what we had experienced in Juarez. There was a kind of a party atmosphere going on with food and music and stuff. It didn't feel dangerous. These people are decent, hardworking, law-abiding farming folk, and they were really pleased to see us. Really nice people, amazed that a bunch of foreigners had arrived there. And they were very gracious and very courteous to us the whole time. It's like, you've come from Britain. It's like, yeah, we've come from Britain to do this story. I think that actual complete and utter shock that anyone cared. But, you know, nobody was drinking. They were clearly taking this very seriously. There were younger guys who were going out to do perimeter security around the local area. You want to take a walk? Uh -huh. We had not planned for Jorge to be the main character in our story, but there was something about him that was incredibly warm and genuine. So Jorge just kind of very naturally and organically became our character. Uh, Jessica? Jessica, yeah. yeah. The conflict between the farmers and the government it had been quite violent. What had made matters much worse is that soldiers had shot dead one of the local farmers, a young woman named Jessica, who was very involved and very well loved by the community. And this really escalated the situation and more and more farmers started joining the ranks of those who had held onto this reservoir, promising not to give it up. The dam's huge. 
very impressive, several hundred meters up, which isn't the best situation for Stuart to be conducting an interview. My problem is I'm terrible vertigo and I'm really afraid of heights. It is a long way down, isn't it? Yeah, it's very high. I'm generally OK with, with heights and I was moving around to try and get some shots and there was a substantial uh, railing running along. It all seemed perfectly solid to me and I needed to get back a bit and I leant against this section of railing. Boom, suddenly it just went and I, I, I almost went back over the, over the thing. And I saw the round and Richie's going, ah! F me, Richie, I thought I'd lost you then. <laughs> I won't deny, my arse went a little bit then. <laughs> People tried to blow us up and shoot us and God knows what. To go that way would have, would have been a bit of an anti-climax, I think, really. <laughs> I'm just thinking, let's just get this over with as soon as possible. So Jorge and I agreed that we would go up to the top bit of the dam. Got up there and it is staggeringly beautiful. You look across the water for miles and then the sun hitting the hills and then you look out across the valley and it's just green farmland, all of it dependent on one thing, the world's most important probably, and that is water. All the farmers, you can see back down there, 20,000 families. We depends from this water. That is then what made the story that much more important. We weren't just talking about small farmers we're talking about an entire industry that was potentially going to be on its knees because they weren't getting access to water. Those valleys, those farms, don't exist without the water. We knew that there was another dam that the National Guard soldiers were holding and protecting. So we drive down a fairly innocuous looking road, past all the farmland, Turn a corner and sort of look round, and there are soldiers absolutely everywhere. We're getting out, are we allowed to film them? They're in defensive positions, roadblocks, lots of them, all in full combat gear. They were prepared for violence. The soldiers themselves were really heavily armed, both with military weapons, but they also had riot gear. Yeah, it was a real eye-opener. It was kind of surreal to see that many soldiers standing protecting water at a dam. I think at least visually in that moment, I thought, OK, so we've been calling this story Water Wars. Wow, it, it really does sort of look a bit like a war. What we wanted to do was to walk through their checkpoints and go up and see the dam. The army were having absolutely none of it, so we just thought, well, we'll have to find another way around. So Jorge said to us, if you want to see the water from that dam, there's not much of it left, but I can take you around the back roads. Farmers know how to get across their land, and so they knew exactly how to get around the army and take us to what was a huge reservoir, except there was virtually no water left. It went on for mile after mile after mile of basically sort of like a, like a beach. The scene that greeted us it reminded me of a moonscape. Clearly, it had been very heavily drained. There were, like, huge beaches, which had obviously been underwater very recently. It was really strange. I'm not sure I've actually seen terrain like that before. Well, the farmers tell me that this dam and the reservoir has been drained as part of the payment of Mexico's national water debt to the United States. In March, this was full. Suffice to say, in March, I'd have been at least 11 metres underwater. We should have been 11 metres underwater, but it had gone. And that is what they didn't want to happen to the farmer's dam, which was still full. This one had been let out to pay its debt to the United States. Worth remembering, the deal isn't bad for Mexico, it's good. The point is, from Chihuahua State, it's bad.
water wars has been predicted as a likely issue for decades. That story is just a microcosm of what is likely to become stories that affect countries all over the world. This is just a tiny version of it, but conflict will happen because of the lack of water as the earth gets warmer and warmer, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. It's one of the things I love about this job. It's, it's a constant adventure, and you genuinely do not know when you set out on the road what you're going to find at the end of that journey. We went off to do what we thought would be another crime story. We decided it just didn't stand up, and we made the right call, and we're all happy that we made that. And then we moved on to another story, which was, you know, could have almost been seen as a backup, but just goes to show that you just don't know what you're going to get and uh, turned out to be a little gem. It's always rewarding, and it happens very rarely, but it is always rewarding to do a story that you feel has actually had an impact. And if that's even just on one person's life, then it's been worth your while. It doesn't have to be a story that changes the world. Within 24 hours, the Mexican and the United States governments reached an agreement they decided to delay the water release and that there would be another arrangement made. I genuinely believe that happened as a direct result of our story. It was pretty special. Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? You've been out riding fences for so long now it may be raining but there's a rainbow above you you better